Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pam Russell, and I am the Acting Director for National RTAP. We are delighted to kick off a five-part 2010 webinar series today entitled Dawning of a New Era in Community Transit. And to have John W. Martin lead us in what I know to be a very informative, entertaining, and provocative series. This series is based on a fabulous speech we heard Mr. Martin deliver at the Ashto State Chapters meeting several months ago. John Martin is the President and CEO of the National Marketing Research Company called SIR Research, based in Richmond, Virginia. His firm has been around for 45 years and has conducted over 13,000 surveys, focus groups, and one-on-one -on -one studies making SRR Research one of the oldest and most experienced research companies in America. The firm's logo has a puzzle man at its center, symbolizing what they do. They figure things out. They help clients learn what makes people tick, why do people do and, do and say the things they do, they're experts at understanding consumer behavior. You probably recognize some of the clients that SIR serves with its professional marketing research expertise. One of the major categories that SIR serves is transportation. They help state, regional, and local transportation transit agencies, PDCs, MPOs, and TDM agencies study their stakeholder audiences, including riders and commuters. SIR studies everything from community impact of transit services to transit consumer satisfaction. Over the years, SIR has become an expert in understanding generational dynamics, how generational differences affect consumer attitudes, preferences, and decision-making. In 2003, John led his firm in creating the Boomer Project, what has become a national authority on the impact of generational dynamics on marketing communications. The SIR Boomer Project has been busy helping major companies understand how generational dynamics play a role in their industry and on the purchase of their respective products and services. SIR uses their generational expertise in transportation industry as well. John and his folks at SIR and the SIR Boomer Project have learned so much about generations they even wrote a book on the topic, The Boomer Consumer. This book has sold over 15,000 copies and was named Top 10 Business Book by Corbis, a Bill Gates publishing company. When John isn't helping clients, he's often being sought by national press. Just Google the Boomer Project and you'll see how much of an authority they have become. The Boomer Project has been on NBC News, CBS News, and Business Week, Newsweek, Barron's, and a whole host of other mainstream press. So I hope you are now as excited as I am to have John share a few remarks with us on the future of community transit. One housekeeping duty before we let John start. Please note on your screen that you can submit a question at any time to John. He will answer them at the end of his remarks, and we plan to produce a white paper that will capture much of what he will share. So don't worry if you miss something, as John has packed a ton of insights and recommendations into his 45-minute presentation. So without further ado, here's John Martin. Thank you, Pam, for that kind introduction, and welcome, everybody. We do have a lot to cover in a short period of time, so I'm going to jump right into it. We're going to touch on three major topics. The first one is going to be seismic shifts reshaping the future of transit. We're going to talk about major trends that are uh, changing the landscape. And then we're going to go into strategic imperatives for rural transit agencies, how to capitalize on these big trends and then end with some recommended next steps for, for transit operators and for RTAP. So let's start at the beginning, the seismic shifts reshaping the future of transit. I've got uh, a handful for you, and I'm starting with the biggest ones, and so you have to start with technology. A huge shift is taking place in America and across the world as our computers get smarter and smarter and smaller and smaller. In fact, now they really fit literally into the palm of our hand. I don't know how many of you guys have an iPhone, but this little device is the most powerful thing I've ever seen. About 8% of America has one, but the, what it does is allow you to really be in touch with your world with just a touch of your finger. To 
day there are hundreds of iPhone apps that you can download that provide real-time next bus information. And for some of you that already have this uh, real-time information, the iPhone now allows people to carry it around with them to find out exactly where their bus is or when their bus is coming. It's fascinating to look at these things and to see how much you can play with them and how many apps you can download. In fact, other phones are coming out with them now. Uh, the Android phone, it's a Google phone, is going to have uh, this application. And you can go to any stop at this uh, address URL and, and check it out. The reason I think that this technology is so profound is that it literally is changing industries. It's uh, just intermediating in so many ways. We do a lot of work in the ride-share business, and it used to be that for ride-sharing, you would have large central databases owned by the government and managed by for the, the MPO of the area. Well, with the advent of the iPhone and instantaneous matching, there are all kinds of private sector services that have come out that now allow you to get matched up with someone in your own building in, in a downtown setting or in the, in the suburbs to find someone. So they basically are preempting the huge investment that governments have made in those large databases. So technology is certainly a game changer and one that we have to watch and one that's going to shape our future. Another major shift we call the new through movement. Let me explain what that is. We have a little fun with that word. But before the recession, America really started to go down the green path in a big way. In fact, we think the green movement really took root when Walmart decided to go and sell a certain kind of light bulb. And through our research back in 2007, 2006, we were surprised to find that green really had become mainstream, that 80% of consumers in America think and or act green, and over half would spend more money to be green. Well, it's a little deeper than just being green. Something else started to shift as well. And that was our mindset about how, how we buy goods and services. I think we finally have come to the realization that we were a throwaway society, that we would buy a coffee maker for $10 and we expected it to break and that was fine, we'd go buy another one. There's a wonderful uh, film on the story of stuff.com put together by Annie Leonard that talks about how our society was possibly hoodwinked by industrial designers back in the 50s to teach us that, yes, you buy things and they wear out and you throw them away. And we sort of bought into that in a big way, but I think once the green movement started to get hold, this sustainability idea came out, and we started to think about some of the goods and services we were buying in a different way, and our manufacturers started to catch on. And then, out of the blue comes this great recession, and I think that's the perfect name for it, the great recession, because with the green movement and this idea of sustainability, all of a sudden, we had a different shift in the way we viewed money. We stopped keeping score with salary and with money, and our view of money started shifting. And we started thinking about what we were buying in terms of goods and services, and it really became sort of back to the future. We sort of went back to an old edict or a New England maximum, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. And this is sort of what we're seeing now in our society, that we have reached this sort of new fruit, if you will, this materialism, sort of the experiences are more important than stuff, the recession, this hunker down time, and then this whole green movement, sustainability movement, has created this new frugality, the new fruit, we call it. And if you think about all of them coming together into the new fruit, and starting this sort of wave, the way we sum up the new frugality in just a sentence is that you spend less, you live smaller, you live smarter, and you have a smaller greenhouse gas footprint. So let's think about that for a minute, some of the companies that we patronize and some of the institutions that are going on. Think about these, these names on this slide. Which ones best symbolize America today? Walmart, Google, Microsoft, NFL, Goldman Sachs? Well, in a survey recently, Walmart shined in terms of best symbolizing America today. And it's kind of interesting after we just come off Super Bowl Sunday to see how the NFL, uh, only 6% of America says that it symbolizes America today. So if we have to give an award, we would say the new fru is uh, exemplified by Walmart. And it's something that we all have to consider as transit operators. 
whether uh, it's big transit systems in urban areas or in rural areas, you have to think about this mindset that their customers have. Another shift, a huge shift, is new generational dynamics that are taking place. Everyone seems to have generations on the brain. And it's fascinating just this last Sunday watching all those Super Bowl spots to see one in particular that talked about generations. So why don't we take a look at this? Look among all ride chairs, we see the fall off 
from boomers to Gen Xers to Gen Y. The younger the folks are, the less likely they are to own a car. But how difficult would it be to get around in your daily activities without a vehicle? And we again see that fall off. For Gen Ys, they're just used to not having a car. It's just not a car-centric world for them. And I will tell you in some articles I read about Japanese car manufacturers, they're very concerned because this is the same trend that's happening in Japan as well. The younger generations are just not as car-centric. They seem to be more interested uh, in civic causes than previous generations. This younger generation, and I go back to my children, it's required in school that they donate some of their time. In fact, they can't even get their report cards unless they're contributing to civic causes. And I think this is fascinating because the modern-day convention is that young people are spoiled and they just don't have uh, interest in other people. They're just so materialistic. But we're not seeing this with our youngest generation, the millennials. And I think this next TV spot really clearly kind of captures what millennials are like. We put this together uh, in a contest AARP put on. So let's take a look at this. I am part of a lost generation, and I refuse to believe that I can change the world. I realize this may be a shock, but happiness comes from within is a lie, and money will make me happy. So in 30 years, I will tell my children they are not the most important thing in my life. My employer will know that I have my priorities straight, because work is more important than family. I tell you this, once upon a time, families stayed together. But this will not be true in my era. This is a quick-fix society. Experts tell me 30 years from now I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. I do not concede that I will live in a country of my own making. In the future, environmental destruction will be the norm. No longer can it be said that my peers and I care about this earth. It will be evident that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It is foolish to presume that there is hope. And all of this will come true unless we choose to reverse it. There is hope. It is foolish to presume that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It will be evident that my peers and I care about this earth. No longer can it be said that environmental destruction will be the norm. In the future, I will live in a country of my own making. I do not concede that 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. Experts tell me this is a quick fix society, but this will not be true in my era. Families stayed together once upon a time. I tell you this. Family is more important than work. I have my priorities straight because my employer will know that they are not the most important thing in my life. So in 30 years, I will tell my children, money will make me happy is a lie, and true happiness comes from within. I realize this may be a shock, but I can change the world, and I refuse to believe that I am part of a lost generation. It was a wonderful piece of work that these guys put together. The conclusion is we really need to maximize the conversion of Gen Y trial today. These guys are going to be an army of customers for us in the future. In fact, the largest one we've ever had, and they're oriented towards us, which is an amazing thing. They're sort of uh, pre-wired to try transit. All right, let's talk about another generation, something that we study all the time here at the Boomer Project, baby boomers, born between 1946 and 1960. So ages 45 to 63. And this generation is aptly named boomers. Before millennials ever came along, boomers had the distinction of being the largest generation ever. Some 76 million of us baby boomers in America. But what's so interesting is when we look at the other generations ahead of boomers, the greatest generation and the silent generation, we look at their sizes and we realize that right now in America, there are only 45 million left alive of the greatest and silent generation. Because of the miracle of medical science and the longevity revolution that's happening, baby boomers from 76 million, where there are like 72 million alive today, are going to replace those 45 million seniors alive. And so what's going to happen is basically America's going through an age wave. And if you project out from 2000 to 2030, we're going to see an increase in our 65-plus population grow from roughly 11% to 19%. That is amazing. We're going to have the doubling of the senior population. So we're going to watch the age wave happen, and we don't have to go very far to see what it's like. Just go down to Florida right now. Already, 
20% of Florida's population is over 65 years old. So any town in Florida, just go and look at the shopping mall and just see what it looks like. That's pretty much coming to a neighborhood near you. Some states will grow more than others in its senior population, but on average, it's going to grow about 20% of the 65-plus population over today at 10%. Well, what does this have to do with transit? Well, there's a fact. There's a fundamental truth about growing older that we change as we age, and Barbie certainly looks a little bit older in this slide. But what happens is our warranty runs out. Our hearing is impaired, our eyesight gets worse, and we get a little more confused when we get to intersections and look at a stoplight and see all different kinds of lights coming at us. Well, it has an implication for our driving habits and, this, and our ability to drive. In 2005, 11% of the fatal crashes involved drivers 65-plus. When experts project What's going to happen in the future? They're saying that by 2030, 25% of all fatal crashes are going to be due to people 65 and older. Well, this is just unacceptable. And so a lot of transportation departments are already trying to do things. The first phase is going to be making existing travel infrastructure a little bit safer. And some of the really innovative things going on around the country to do this, I think, uh, are exemplified in a couple of stories here putting little LED lights that are powered by the sun around stop signs. What a perfect idea. But even better than that is this idea of painting little optical speed bars on highways, especially when they're coming up around a turn that might be a, a stop sign. These bars make you feel like you're speeding, even though you're not when you're driving on this road. And I would like to have these painted on every road for my teenage drivers. But that's the first phase. The second phase is really going to be increasing driver licensing requirements, and we're already starting to see this happen in some states. And it's important because this runs counter to how boomers think and how they envision their own future. Boomers, through our research, said they're going to seek ways to age in place. In fact, 88% of boomers said, I plan to live at home. I do not want to go off to a retirement community. I want to stay engaged in my community. And our survey work will ask them, well, what if you had a debilitating disease? How does that change your perspective? And even with a debilitating illness, seven in ten boomers said, no, I want to live at home. Well, here's the rub. 58% said it would be very difficult to stay in their current home if they were no longer able to drive. And so this conflict is something that we're going to have to address because more and more boomers are going to find themselves stranded in suburbia. So our conclusion is that we need to get boomers on board now in order to serve them in the future. So it's these two generations, the boomers and the millennials, that provide us a tremendous opportunity as the largest number of choice riders in the history of transit is really headed our way. Shift number four, the New Deal. Well, there was a famous New Deal back after the stock market crash in the late 20s that it took us to the 30s to get out of. Well, Obama's come in, and he's got big plans and we've been seeing them roll out. And whether you agree with the plans or not, the point is millions of dollars have been now invested in transit. But more important than that is that gazillions of conversations are going on about transit for the first time, about TDM. And it's sort of becoming mainstream that maybe we can't build our way out of congestion, that maybe all of these TDM and transit opportunities are the way of the future. And having been in this business for 20 years, it's wonderful to hear my friends bring it up for the first time. So I think what we have going on here is really the wonderful convergence of the new and old generations, sort of the new deal, our new technology, and this whole mindset, this new fru, which are all coming together and creating what we think is the biggest opportunity for transit in the history of, well, in the history of our lifetime. And so it's up to us to really take advantage of this. We really have to take advantage of these shifts and, ma and maximize it to our advantage to really make transit all it can be in the future. And there's sort of two ways to do this. One way is the old way, and it's sort of to do things the standard way we've always been doing it. The new way is to really think about these shifts as an opportunity and to sort of change the way we're doing things and to try to find better ways to uh, run our programs. And that takes us to the second section of our presentation, which are 10 strategic imperatives for rural transit systems to capitalize on for these seismic shifts. 
these ten imperatives are really how to train, transform the role and impact of transit. And we've organized them around five imperatives for rural transit agencies, for each agency to embrace and to practice. And then secondly, for the rural transit industry, five imperatives, and for RTAP to consider and to advance among transit agencies. So we're going to go through each of these, but there is one common thread that I really want to make everyone understand and hope you take away from this first webinar, and that's that the future is really all about being customer-centric. And this thread goes throughout all ten of these imperatives. So let's get into this first one, identify and meet customer needs. Well, the old way is really that transit companies were run by the operations department. We're moving transit riders from point A to point B, and we can do that uh, if the operations department will let us. The new way is to run the system with marketing at the helm, satisfying customers' mobility needs A to Z. And we're going to get into this in a little bit here. Because it always starts with research and insights, and they, that leads to action. And this is a question that we ask ourselves often in working on transportation assignments. How can we make our customer lives better? How can we really serve their needs? Well, there are decades of research on what drives no choice and why more people don't take transit. It really comes down to these simple little attributes. That the, the transportation characteristics and personal preferences are for dependability, safety, flexibility, and time. These are the things that people say that they think about, that they feel when it comes to deciding what mode they're going to take. And there's also one other factor. It's a huge factor. It's the alternative to taking a, a transit. It's my car. Unfortunately or fortunately, cars have become a personal vehicle that gives you all the comforts of home, from leather seats to high-end stereos to climate control, everything you could want. And it also satisfies a huge want that we all have, the craving to be individuals. Alfred Sloan was probably one of the greatest marketers ever. He was the guy that really started the annual styling changes system. And he said, you know what, we can have a car and change it every year and get people to buy new ones. And we can offer different kind of cars at the same time because there's so many different kinds of people out there. More than anything else, Alfred Sloan realized that in marketing, it's all about me, how it makes me feel, what it says about me. And so when we look at the future of transit and we think about this sort of customer-centric idea, we're saying, wow, we need to invest in a more appealing image because when people get on a bus or a van, those people that have the alternative to, to use their car or not, they want to feel good that they're getting onto a vehicle that really sort of makes them feel like they really are themselves. So investing in a more appealing image, when we see images like this of some of the buses of the future or the, some of the latest bus styles that come out, we said this is going in the right direction. The consumer needs to be brought in to this choice of how buses are designed. They even need to be brought in to how bus stops are designed. This is an urban bus stop for in the future, it looks like. But when I look at this bus stop and I look at the people there, I say, wow, I wouldn't mind riding on a bus right there, especially with those people. Well, this isn't the future. This is actually happening right now in Florence, Italy. This just sleek kind of styling makes sense. It looks current and hip. And it's not always about the hardware or the styling. It can also be the software or how you present your services. There's a wonderful little transit service in Charlottesville, Virginia, called John. It's a community transit service that recognizes this innate need to feel good about your transportation vehicle. And so they have a whole campaign called Ride with the Stars, and they really play it up, and they make the people that ride on John feel like a movie star, and that's what their advertising is all about, and they pay it off very well. And we love uh, watching the latest innovations that come out of this group. So what to do? Make your image just as important as your service because it becomes part of it. But also to provide remarkable customer service experiences. I don't, you don't have to go very far to see what I'm talking about. Gander Mountain, the new retailer on the scene, it's not really all about retail. It's a lot about entertainment. In fact, there's a word, retailment. And they know how to get you in the store and keep you there and let you do all these things from indoor archery to outdoor cooking all under their roof. Airports are coming on with this idea as well, putting on local wine tasting. I don't, I don't think flying ever was as fun now that this has arrived. 
But you think about it from your transit service. How can you do that from everything from bike racks to movies inside? And one of the services that we're familiar with, the Max, which is uh, in the Hampton market, they have Wi-Fi on board now, which is just thinking about how do I make that customer experience the best I can make it. And so I would encourage you to think about those ways and get your friends to ride your services and think about how can I improve the experience here. Another idea is to move towards mass customization of service delivery. I don't know about you, but we get a lot of LL Bean catalogs in my house, and they're different. There's one for me for fly fishing and one for my teenagers and one for my wife. It's because L.L. Bean knows so much about us. And it's the same thing that BDOT has figured out with their 511 to allow you to customize your dashboard that you can look at the roads you drive on. Well, today we do have this next bus technology where people can look at see when their bus is arriving at services at their um, different bus stops. But as I mentioned, with the technology coming of an age, we're going to be able to do this from our hands with these iPhones and the new Android phones. So you might not afford it today, but you've got to keep your eye on this because it's such a game changer for the future. It just makes transportation so much easier when you feel like you're in control of it. So the conclusion is that services and innovation centered on customer needs will drive transit agencies for the future. And speaking of the future, we're going to have a webinar on April the 15th as part of this series on details on customer-centric marketing. So be sure to mark your calendar for that. Let's move on to number two, providing exceptional customer service. This is another major imperative to really reshape the future of transit and leverage some of those trends. The old way of customer service was that the customer defined sort of the customer service was defined by the transit agency's internal needs. What can we do? What can we deliver? The new way is that customer service is defined by our customer needs. Here's a fun cartoon that puts us into some perspective. Someone calling themselves a customer wants something they call service. Well, customer service is alive and well, and it's really important to transit. And I'm going to share with you an example in some of our research to show you just how important customer service is. We work with Art Arlington uh, Transit System in Northern Virginia, and we wanted to understand what drove sort of customer satisfaction and customer service. So we did an onboard study and we tested all of these different attributes, from driver is courteous to bus is clean to bus is comfortable, bus is reliable, and we got ratings on a one to five scale. And we also asked on a one to five scale how satisfied were you with ART among its riders. And what we wanted to do is to, through regression analysis, through statistical diagnostics, figure out if we increased any of these attributes on the left, would it have a corresponding increase with driving satisfaction on ART? And when we did that, we wanted to see which attributes are really the key leading indicators, which ones correlate with this higher satisfaction, so we could focus on those attributes. We've done this for a number of bus systems and transit systems and community transit systems, and we're starting to see sort of the same patterns emerge. This slide shows those attributes that had the perfect one-to-one -one correlation or correlation to uh, when, when you improved on the left where you would get an increase in satisfaction on the right. And the coefficient shows the greater the degree of correlation. Driver is courteous was the number one correlation. People that tended to rate their driver as being courteous on a one to five scale that gave a higher score there would give a higher score with satisfaction of art. So let's think about this. Driver is curious. If that's the number one attribute, and we've seen it in, in several studies, then what drives somebody being courteous. So let's explore this word just a minute and think about what are, what are the attributes of a person that you think is very curious? Uh, courteous. Well, competence is one. Uh, sensitivity to the needs of others. They're sort of service-oriented people. And they take pride in everything they're associated with. So that, to us, sort of defines being courteous. And if you think about that, and you go back and you look at the other attributes, if somebody's courteous, if you have a courteous bus driver, chances are some of these other attributes actually probably are pretty highly scored. Because if you're courteous, you're probably thinking about, is my bus clean? And you're picking up trash from patrons that just got off the bus. And you're probably telling, calling people by name or uh, making them feel welcome when they get on. 
Well, all of those things drive that satisfaction with art. If you can drive courteous, if you can get your bus drivers to get courteous. And so some of our clients now are making sure they recruit people who are courteous and put in courteous training as part of their uh, internal training system. So create a customer service culture. And it's not only training, it's everything that you do. One of the really interesting things that we came across was with a client in Maryland, the highway department that actually came up with a customer bill of rights. And here are all the different rights that they say their customers have. And one of them, the first one, is customers have the right to be treated in a respectful, courteous, and professional manner. Well, you don't have to go too far out of the highway department to find other bill of rights in the transit industry. Um, in Illinois, South Central Transit System has their own customer bill of rights. But I would suggest that everyone on this phone call and others should think about, can I put together a bill of rights that I can teach everybody in my system uh, that works for us about the customer being in charge and them having rights just like we do. So train your staff uh, to be customer service oriented. And when you're doing that, think about different generational needs and the differences that people have uh, that, that, are, that make up different generations. Let me give you an example here. Um, in, in terms of a generational perspective, at what age is someone over the hill? I want you to think about this. The person on the left is a young girl. What does she think someone's over the hill? Now you have another rider who is maybe 70 years old or so. At what age do they think someone's over the hill? So I want you to do a fun exercise for me to make this point. Think about your actual age, and then think about your perceived age, and then do the math. And, and what's the difference in terms of how old you are but how old you feel you are? And while you're doing that, take a look at this TV spot and have a little fun with this. And I want to warn you, it's rated uh, PG-13. Let's see what this is like. All right. Check it. Three aces. Nice, but nicer. Full house. Ooh. Nice. Royal flush. Centrum Silver. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that joke. We won't play it again. Let's move on. That was a lot of fun because it makes the point that, that you know what, in our minds we can be a lot younger. And in our national research with the Boomer Project, our actual age of boomers under 50 is 45, but the perceived age, how boomers felt they were, was 35. There was a 10-year gap. When we look at the older boomers, it's a 14-year gap between actual age and perceived age. And I wonder what your math showed, if you felt younger than you are or older. If you're like most people, you feel younger. And here's the implication for it. When you think about when middle age starts, in our surveys we ask boomers, when does middle age start? They'll say 48. When does old age start? They'll say 73. So boomers are putting themselves at the beginning of middle age. When we do the same question for younger people, we said, when does middle age start? They'll say 38. So they are actually pushing boomers into middle age. And they're saying old age will start in, you know, say the 60s, which really is quite disturbing. But let's look at this in terms of back to our customer service representative. At what age is someone over the hill? Well, the younger person saying 57, the older person saying 75, and there is ageism bias in our society. So we have to teach our younger folks, many of the people that are online and at our phones and, and answering customer calls, to really respect older people and really appreciate sort of these age differences. And let's complicate that with someone with disabilities and communicating with them. You just can't make assumptions about what person can and cannot do. Uh, you, you just can't take over for them. You've got to ask them how you can help. And you have to address the person with the disability directly. You can't speak through them. You guys know all of this, but is it into your training, especially is it in your training for younger people, how they deal with older people? So think about that, 
especially as you're thinking about measuring and reporting your customer satisfaction, which is a key indicator to how well you're being customer-centric. Back to that Bill of Rights that the Highway Department of Maryland has. One of their Bill of Rights is that customers have the right to express their level of satisfaction. The customers can actually say, yes, this is how I feel, and they go out of their way to find out. Well, measuring satisfaction used to be that you just ask people, are you satisfied? Right on a one to five scale. Well, now there's a new way to measure customer satisfaction that everyone here can incorporate into their customer satisfaction surveys. It's called the Net Promoter Score. And there's a whole industry that's been built around this. And there's a book that's come out by Fred Reichel, and he's part of the Bain and Company of Consultancy out of Boston. And the whole idea here is that people, in terms of their satisfaction, they will say they're satisfied, and they are. But the real measure of satisfaction is loyalty. How loyal are you to a product or service? And they figured out through uh, the Net Promoter Score, how likely are you to recommend a service or product to your family or friend on a 1 to 10 scale is the best way to get at satisfaction. Let me explain the Net Promoter Score real quick. It's basically getting a reading on that 1 to 10 rating on how you would, would you recommend a friend or family to ride art or to ride your transit system? And what you do is you take those that gave you a 9 or 10 rating. In this case, 66% of the riders did. And then you take away from that the distractors, people that gave you a 0 through 6 rating. In this case, 15%. So the net promoter score is 51%. Well, the value of using net promoter score uh, analytics like this, and it's not that complicated, is that you can compare it to other major brands that you know and potentially even patronize. Like, for instance, Southwest Airlines, 51%. And you can get net promoter scores from the Internet. Just Google them, and you'll see all the companies that have been reported. Apple, 66% net promoter score. eBay, 71% net promoter score. Harley-Davidson, 81% net promoter score. Now, how about Arlington Bus Service? What would you think their net promoter score would be? Well, at first, the transit director didn't want to do this study because he was scared of this question. But when he got the answer, he made it into a button because he had the highest net promoter score of any other service in Arlington Transportation Division. 84% net promoter score for the bus service there. So the conclusion is, in a world of commodity services, strive to deliver an uncommon service. And we're going to go into much more detail about this on June 17th in one of the webinar series, Exceptional Customer Service. Let's move on to number three. Aggressively market and promote all services and alternatives to drive alone. Well, the old way was to provide information and riders sort of discovered you. The new way is aggressive outreach to target and sell services to customers. So what to do? Well, the first thing is to include all transportation choices as part of your service, your portfolio of services. Don't just promote what you literally deliver, but try to create a system where you can team up with other people in the transportation business in your market. And let me tell you why. In a huge study we did for the state of Virginia called the State of the Commute Study, we interviewed 7,000 people across the state, very long survey. We found so many interesting things. One of them is that there's a tremendous turnover in people who use the bus and use TDM uh, modes. About a third of the market turns over every year. So you have to always be out there. And if you team up with other people, you can really leverage your budget and be customer-centric in terms of offering mobility, not mode-centric in terms of what you do versus them. Because where do people come from? Where do riders of the bus come from? Well, in that same study, almost half of the current bus riders came from other ride-sharing modes. From drive alone, yes, was half of it, but the other half came from walking and carpooling and biking. So think about the other modes as your friend in a way to team up with them to really focus on customer needs. So ride-sharing and TD agencies, they support transit. They're not your enemies. One of the ways to look at this is the question we asked, what information services were you seeking from a ride-share program? And people who called the ride-share hotline, half of them were asking for transit information. And when you looked at this in the urban cities, the urban cores, like Northern Virginia, the number was even higher. So ride-share and TDM is actually your friend. And some very enlightened transit agencies 
putting together transportation guides that really celebrate all modes, not just their service, all ride-sharing modes, that is. So we love seeing brochures like this. Um, Arlington County uh, took this one step further and created a whole commuter store on wheels. And inside that bus is a whole library that people can go in and uh, buy passes and get information on all kinds of modes. I think there's a great lesson in this for rural operators and that those of you that embrace the one-call service, congratulations, because that really seems like the future where the, the mode... You don't really organize yourself around uh, the mode. You organize around the customer. The customer can call in, then you can service them. So do that and follow suit with, with creating those one-call services and try to make them as streamlined as possible. But also think about your brand. And try to create a service brand personality. Here's a great example of some folks in Fredericksburg. They sort of named their bus line Fred, and all the people that work on Fred, the drivers and the service bureau and the operations people, all wear a badge that uh, has their first name Fred. And so they made this part of their brand, part of their system. Also include how to use messages and iconology. Um, we do a lot of ethnographic research. and We follow people around and see sort of what behavior they're doing. And one of the things we see when it comes to transit research, why people don't take transit, we hear people say, I just don't know how to use the bus. They will admit it to us. We have them one-on-one, -on -one, and we'll ask them, why didn't you get on the bus there? You were at that transit stop. And they'll say, I just don't know how to use it. Well, some enlightened services are starting to do that, and here's one. And you can go on the website and really be able to uh, download brochures about how to use the service. Uh, this is Stanovos, and it, you can go on and look at their site and really get a sense of all the different videos that people can play to understand how to use their service. Another really innovative thing to do is to show where your service is going. And here's a bus system that literally painted the route on the outside of the buses. So it really takes the brand to heart. So this is easy to use. This is where we go. Another thing to do is to drive trial. And back to our Charlottesville example, some are youth ride free in the program. And they do this so they can sign up not only the youth, but get the parents to come in to register the youth. In Washington, they do ride free on ozone alert days, and all the bus systems honor this to give people a chance at experimenting to see what transit's like. And something that's just come out, the Cherokee Nation has partnered up with transit systems to provide public transportation for free on Fridays and made it fun and put videos on the buses. Let's move on to another imperative, and that's to be green to get the green. The old way of doing things is to take transit so you can help the environment, and that was a claim people used to make. The new way is that really being green isn't a huge generator of people taking transit. It has to be other things as well, but it's still important to talk about being green, to build support for transit, that people that are taking transit are helping the environment. Let me explain. In our research about why people ride share, we always see save money, save time, reduce stress. That's always at the top of the list. And save the environment's number four. Well, we're not seeing this change. We're not seeing save the environment pop up into those top three, even during this green movement and even during the recession. It's still important. It's just not a driver on why you take transit. And so when we think about the green sustainability movement, a lot of people have gotten caught up in it. And even our own research, back to that green study, we're seeing so many people fall across different dimensions of green as green consumers, from low green to green to greener to greenest. Yes, almost 8 in 10 people are green these days or have green behavior. But that doesn't mean that as CDM and transit markers, we should really start to say, look for green in every ride and really base our whole campaign on being green. We have to be a little more guarded than that because we're not seeing Save the Environment be the number one reason for ride sharing or using transit. It's certainly becoming more important, but it's not trumping save money and saving time. But here's the interesting insight. And in some of the work we've done, when we ask about the societal benefits of TDM and ride sharing and transit, and we have questions like how important is it for you that your locality, or Virginia in this case, invest in programs to support and make transportation options more available commuters for commuters, we see strong support among ride shares. They say, yes, you should invest in these kind of modes. This really does help us. But the interesting thing is we see that same level of investment equally strong for the drive alone. That they're saying, yes, 
Virginia, yes, you should invest in these modes to support ride sharing. And why are they doing that? Well, when we go deep into the research, we find out is that those drive alone do want to have an impact on the environment, and they feel like they can't drive alone or they can't ride share, and they're so grateful that other people do. So they support TDM. So when we talk about being green, we talk about it being green to get support for ride sharing. Be green not to attract transit riders, but to cultivate non-rider support. And so we see GRTC doing it well. Try transit, save money, the number one benefit, and the environment. And parenthetically, this group has just built a new environmental headquarters, which is, is really fancy. And I think it's a metaphor for their whole system and, and what they stand for. Number five, measure and report your real impacts. And this is something that is starting to be a new science in transit. The old way was to say, we're successful. We have this many buses, this many routes, this many riders. Well, the new way is to look at outcomes and impacts, to really start thinking about, you know, what is your impact and how do you tell your story? And the way we do it is through a, a longer-term perspective of trying to assess what is the impact across an entire program in terms of, like, commuter stores and getting people to leave SOV, single occupant vehicle travel, and to do carpooling and, and using transit. And so what's the impact of the commuter store in that conversion and perhaps the website, the commuter page, or the biking programs? And in doing this in Arlington County, we've been able to quantify that the programs responsible for reducing 38,000 daily trips every day or 542,000 VMTs being eliminated. And when you know those sort of numbers on the VMTs, you can then compute air quality impacts. In Arlington County, because of their transportation programs, they're seeing a reduction in their carbon footprint by huge amounts, as listed on this slide. And the neat thing to do is to take these sort of numbers and to put them into lay speak and make it understandable. So 19,000 daily trips really translates into taking, like in this case, more than twice of 7,000 morning passenger trips made on the Virginia Railway Express. So moving on, take this sort of information and then really, really uh, create an impact report and talk about these outcomes, not just these outputs, not just how many people are riding, but the impact you're making on your community. And, and even if you do the net promoter score, include that. So why is it important to report community impact? Well, I want to share with you in this next spot something that happened at a board meeting when the county administrators and the county elected officials had one of these impact reports, and they knew what the numbers were by looking at the report when they got a question from one of their uh, citizens to say, maybe cut this budget of this transportation agency. Let's take a look. Just a very quick comment, but um, I'm also glad, just as with NC, we pulled it, Mary did, to be able to acknowledge some of the good work, and you've just heard from staff, you've heard from Chris. Um, but over the years I've been on the board, this is really one of those um, parts of our community that is sort of a hidden treasure, a hidden success. And we are a model, as you just heard. Uh, people come from around the country to see how we've done it. The website it's uh, and, and the rest of the program, it's about going beyond the metro system and educating, creating awareness, marketing, uh, and doing all that in a creative way that takes the maximum advantage of the assets you have by tapping into the citizens, the residents, the visitors, and the businesses here in our community. Um, and I'd just like to point out the last piece that in the last years, it's the research. Um, it's only been about three or four years uh, we've been accumulating it for a long time, but we have such a track record here that we now have a robust data, set of data on how we do it, what the outcomes are, and how it is working. Nobody can challenge that when you're actually tracking the success of your program and people come from all over the place to get our data and use it to help convince somebody at the other end to do what we're doing here in Arlington. So. Uh, this is a terrific program. You guys do great work. Yeah, yeah this really is a, um, an element of success in our county, and I hope that we become even more creative with our outreach efforts.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to go into great detail about how to measure and report impacts on August the 12th in this continuing webinar series, so be sure to put that on your calendar as well. And we want, hopefully, to give you the tools for you to be able to do impact reporting on your community transit system. So that's the first five that all transit agencies should advance. Now we're going to move to sort of the back five, and this is what the transit industry needs to consider. And we're going to go through these a little quicker, but I want to give you some some feeling in terms of what we need to do collectively as an industry. And while it needs to be industry-wide, industry it has to be implemented on a local level. And so the whole idea of involving the public, the old way was inconvenient public hearings. The new way, we think, is using these ultra-convenient survey-based online engagement tools. In some of our research, we've uncovered that 13% say they're involved in transportation planning. Well, that's great, 13%. I think that number is pretty high. We ask people, well, how many would you, how much do, would you really like to be involved um, if it were more convenient? And 25% said, boy, I would really like to be involved if I could. And so we have to ask, well, what's in the way? How come more people aren't involved in sort of the transit conversation? Well, there are two reasons. The first one is the medium, and the second one is the message. Let's talk about the medium first. There's a um, question we asked in one of our studies, to which one of these communication vehicles would you prefer to voice your opinions about this project? By and far away, 45% said online, Internet. People want to voice their opinions that way. And in fact, when we do surveys, we ask people at the end, will you give us your home email for us to include you on subsequent surveys? And a third of the people in America will give us their home email. That's how much people want to be involved. So let's talk about the future. How do we change this? Well, we had an opportunity to work in Charlottesville on a little project for the uh, Federal Transit Administration to figure out, could we have new ways of involving people in public uh, involvement? And so we tested all kinds of things, like taking surveys into senior centers and to lower housing, lower income housing, to do online URLs, uh, online surveys, and let the media announce it, and to really try to get people to participate, not just at a public hearing, but but to weigh in on the future of transit and do all these sort of innovative ways. Um, we asked respondents for their input on service enhancement, on potential funding organizations. And when it was all said and done, using all these different techniques, we had 4,500 people participate in that public input process. And in fact, now a toolkit is going to be put together on our lessons learned there and shared with uh, community transit systems across the country. So we'll let you know when that's ready. So what to do? I think the industry needs to help transit agencies use innovative public input channels to engage the public. The second challenge, though, is the message. In this next chart, I want you to study it carefully. This was a question we asked people, residents, how important are these particular issues to you in your daily lives and planning for, the, for your community? Of course, education and security at the top of the list. Then there's health care and so forth and so on. Transportation's at the bottom of the list. So when we look at this, we say, oh, my gosh, this is, this is the hierarchy of concerns. If we're going to push transportation up in importance, we're going to need to cloak it with all these other higher-order issues to be able to talk about transportation in terms of quality education, in terms of safety, in terms of access to medical care. That's going to be really, really important in order to drive transportation up in terms of importance. So what to do, we need as an industry to help transit agencies organize messages around these higher order social causes. Number seven, make business part of transit's business. The old way was riders were important and maybe some stakeholders like the Council of Government or the Board of Supervisors. The new way is multiple stakeholders. Think about all of your stakeholders. And one that often gets left out is business, employers. And let's go back to that slide we were just looking at, residents' importance and rating all these different societal issues, education to security, all the way down to transportation. The same list, when we ask business leaders to rank their importance of these different attributes, transportation went further up on the list. Businesses sort of get it. It sort of moved up in terms of the hierarchy of, of attributes. And it's probably surprising but business leaders really understand a balanced transportation system. We asked in some of our surveys this question in different markets, and we usually get the same kind of answer. 
imagine if you had a hundred dollars to spread across all the transportation needs, providing fund funding to support different services. Assign a hundred dollars across all of these, and look at the answers. About half the money would go to roadways, but surprisingly, an equal amount would go to non-road facilities. I think this at first when we saw this for the first time, we went, "Wow, CEOs really saying." We need to move towards this balanced system and fund these things that aren't just more highways. Well, why are they saying this? And that's what we always like to get to. Well, it's because of their enlightened self-perspective. Business leaders understand that right now their employees are affected by their commute. Fifty percent said, yep, daily commute increases my employee's stress. Thirty-eight percent of business leaders said punctuality. Congestion makes it difficult for my employees to get to work. And thirty percent said, it doesn't give them flexibility. They can't stay late. So when we look at these, we said, wow, they really see these challenges, but they also see the benefits. They're also seeing the benefit of some enlightened companies that have these employer transportation programs. In this slide, ask about which ones of these things have you seen happen at your company with employee transportation programs? Has it improved productivity? 23% of the leaders, business leaders said yes. 18% said when I'm involved with the transportation employee programs, I see a reduced in absenteeism, reduced in turnover. We have been studying this issue for, for 20 years, and we're now seeing the traction that business leaders really are our audience. So we need to help transit agencies across the country, urban and rural, make transit the business of business, organize workforce arguments to recruit and engage business leaders. And we think forming strategic partnerships with chambers of commerce and economic development programs is the way to go. And we're going to get into that in great detail on October the 14th, making business part of rural transit's business and suggest ways on how to do that and how to look at that. Number eight, create partnerships to serve the entire community. The old way, sort of the historic way, was that community transit serves sort of the underserved. The new way is that community transit is the vital link to every community. Think about being so customer-centric that you're focused on unmet needs. What are the unmet needs of my customers out there? If you start asking those kind of questions, it will lead to this question. How can I make my community better? How can I think about going from social services and senior services to helping educational institutions, health systems, workforce support? I want to share with you a video that brings to life how one community really explored this and the kind of services that, that came out of stretching their minds and thinking about what they could offer their community. Take a look. How do you provide public transportation over a vast stretch of farmland dotted with isolated towns? That was the challenge in Central California's rural yet heavily polluted San Joaquin Valley. In the valley, we have nothing but distance and a lot of small communities. Ron Hughes and the Kings County Area Public Transportation Agency took on that challenge and came up with a highly successful solution, van pools. Our van pool project has two benefits. It helps out people in the community who would not otherwise not get to work. But it's helping the air we breathe. Hughes says the program started in 2002 with 28 vans to get farm workers to and from the fields. The van pools provide a insured safe ride with drivers that have had their backgrounds checked. They're insured a ride to work in the morning. They're insured a ride home at night. That's the best project I see it for the people, for the workers in the field. It's marvelous. Today, there are 120 farm worker van pools in the San Joaquin Valley. And the program has expanded to include other workers. The van pool's grown beyond just the farm workers to include state employees, teachers, uh, students. The state employees go to one of the ten prisons. The teachers go to several of the schools around here. And the students go to the colleges. And all of them have the same need to get to where they're going to go. This is my sixth year teaching at Corcoran High School and the first year that I have not driven my own car every day. And I really have enjoyed it. Nearly 4,000 people in this valley ride in 230 van pools every day. It's a great deal. You know, meet more people and it really saves on gas, cars off the road, less accidents, good for the environment. From an environmental standpoint, our program's huge. Uh, we eliminate about 500 tons of pollutants every year. 
in this valley is, is critical. Ron Yu says he and his agency are now helping 11 other California counties to start van pools. It's a transportation strategy he believes can transform life in many rural communities. The importance of van pool life here is huge if we're going to basically have a place we can live and breathe in. I was surprised when I saw that for the first time, so I wanted to share it with you to see just what the possibilities are. So what to do next? The transit industry needs to provide aggressive business training. And I know RTAP has some programs and materials, but we really need as a whole industry to make sure everybody starts to understand this leap from sort of a subsidized social services towards aggressive self-funding business operations. And it really starts by sort of understanding the, how to spot opportunities how to be an active member of your community and how to scout and identify promising opportunities, how to see them. And we listed a few here, but start to get that mindset in terms of how can I grow and how can I grow through partnerships with organizations to serve my community. It, it means training in terms of how to even make that partnership deal work, how to calculate what your costs are to operate your service on a per-mile basis or per-hour basis, and then how to go in and talk to people and sort of do a biopsy on what they're currently paying for their services to operate their transit services, their, their transportation system, and how you can make that business case and they'll listen. Just two more real quick ones. Number nine is to help others sing our own industry praises. You know, the old way was to focus on transit agency self-promotion. Uh, the new way, we think, is employer transit industry and to empower transit industry stakeholder advocacy. You know, it's great when you get a story about yourself and, and what your, your community transit system is doing. Uh, but sometimes the story runs and nothing really happens. You might build a little more brand equity, but we're seeing that some of the success that really gets traction is when you can inspire a group of people to really support you. That's happening with GRTC, uh, transit system in Richmond called Friends of Transit. In three months, they've got 1,700 friends of transit really be their advocacy and, and calling on elected officials and promoting transit around our community. Another group is uh, at projectstir.com. This is a sustainable transportation initiative of Richmond, moving people in a greener way. And some of the goals here is to get over 10,000 people to be ambassadors for transportation demand management and transit in our hometown, and to literally sign up and to be this surrogate sales force say, yes, we want to move towards this balanced transportation system. And so this is a, a way of empowering them and being there for them. So what we think needs to happen is the transit agencies need to learn how to organize local advocacy groups that then will help them achieve goals for the transit agency system as well as for the whole community. Lastly, number 10, share our collective experiences and insights. You know, the, the old way is sort of siloed where tactical insights get, get created from executions for each transit agency, and they're not shared as much. National conferences are a great way, but not everybody can travel. So the new way is to share everything and have sort of an open architecture where everybody can post what works and what doesn't. And so what to do next is to really create and promote a shared information exchange and to do it online. And this is one that we're part of in Department of Railroad Public Transportation in, in Virginia, and another one with, with VDOT. And this is the perfect forum to be able to post studies that, that everybody's done and to talk about the best case studies and best examples, but also to have a collaborative, an open collaborative, where we can talk about new technology and what does it mean. So sharing and sharing as much as possible is part of the future to rechain, to refocus transit. And that gives us the 10 ideas that we've been talking about, these ten sort of new imperatives for transit, some for transit agencies, some for the whole industry. And they really build on the convergence of all of these trends that are happening that really mean it's the dawning of a new era for us. And this new era really starts with a focus on customer-centric orientation. That's really the theme for the day. How do we get back to the customer? The customer on our bus really is the key to the future. And speaking of the future, our recommended next steps are really simple. Really join us and go forward with us as we put on four more webinars in 2010. And I'm going to go down them real quick, and we talked about them all in the last hour. 
customer-centric marketing on April the 15th at 1 o'clock. And then we're going to have exceptional customer service across generations on June the 17th, again at 1 o'clock. Then we're going to have how to measure and report impacts in August, on August the 12th. And then we're going to sum up with how to make business part of rural transit's business on October the 14th. And so hopefully you guys will be experts on at least those four out of the ten uh, as we head into the fall of 2007, 2010. I want to thank you so much for coming on today and listening. It's been a real pleasure to be part of this and kick it off. And now we're going to open it up uh, to questions and answers. Those of you that have been sending questions, Rick Lawson is going to uh, ask some of me, and I'm going to try to address some. And I know we've gone a long time on this first kickoff one. Most of the other sessions will be shorter than this, but we wanted to cover all ten. And uh, we'll answer questions now, and those that we don't, we'll send out the email answers to everybody that's come aboard. Hey there, John. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Rick. Fabulous. Fabulous. Great presentation. Uh, you were very thorough. Uh, we had a uh, one question uh, wanting to know where the STIR advocacy program is taking place, what community is that in, and can you give any further information on that? Um, we can uh, send out links to that after this after this session and try to make sure everybody gets gets a copy of that. But the STIR advocacy program is going on in Richmond, Virginia. If you go to projectstir.com uh, and .org. Okay. And in terms of questions, that was the only one that we had posted. Um, if folks would like to post a question now, they can go ahead and do that, and we can get those uh, updated and answered. We'll give you a minute or so to do that. While you're doing that, we're also going to um, put all of these comments in a white paper that will be disseminated as well through RTAP. The white paper will be um, highlights of these ten imperatives and the um, next steps, as well as the recapping of all of these um, major shifts that are taking place. And that just answered a question that just came in. Where can we get the slides? And I'll have to defer back to our talent network, make them available, and uh, to be able to post them as well as the white paper and any questions that we don't answer. So we're going to have to follow up with everybody. Okay, I just got a response from RTAP that will be posted on the national rtap.org website, and we'll send a, we'll send a link out to those who registered as well if we if we can do that. And that's what I got. I'd like a question. I'd like to ask a question of everybody. If, if a couple people could just weigh in in terms of the video, showing the video in a webinar takes a little extra work from some of our marvelous techn technical support team. Did you find that helpful uh, in this particular video webinar? Uh, the ones that were on the conference call, we were not able to hear the audio of the, the video. Um, but, but the other folks, I believe, were able to hear it. Okay. I just want to thank everybody for um, being on today's presentation. And, John, we look forward to hearing from you guys again in April, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for joining us. Take care.